Hello, welcome. My name's Tony Ingram. Welcome to Walk in the Park. This is episode 70, recorded on March 19th, first to be shown on March 20th, which is the vernal equinox for this year, 2014. So uh, it doesn't feel like spring much out there, but uh, eventually we'll get to it. Uh, we'll, we'll do a little bit of indulging the end of winter here, I think, for the rest of the month. We'll see how it goes. It's been a cold winter, 2014. But uh, we're going to go take a look at uh, something that's uh, going on in our forests. We uh, had a show uh, in November in Six Mile Creek. Uh, we went down there to a group of people where um, it's a little conference. The Cuyahoga Lake, Water Cuyahoga Lake Watershed Network is involved, and the City of Ithaca and Cornell University Department of Natural Resources. And uh, we're looking at hemlock trees. This actually happens to be in Buttermilk Falls State Park. But hemlock trees make a uh, eastern hemlock. Uh, they are the evergreens that you see in this picture in the left-hand side, but they're some of our most uh, prominent uh, gorge trees and are, comp are responsible for a lot of the beauty, but also the ecology of our gorges. And there'll be some explanation of that in the, um, the video I'm going to show you in a few minutes here, but uh, they're really important to our, our ecology in general and our gorges, and so it would be really a shame to lose them and unfortunately, we are losing them. There is an invasive species. You may have heard of it. The um, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid is a tiny little aphid-like insect, which we'll see a lot more of, that is uh, infesting our trees, has come from other places, and uh, has finally arrived here. And uh, it gets on our... Uh, on the needles of the hemlock tree, the hemlock tree has very fine needles. We'll see some more pictures of that. And it slowly feeds on them and it kills them. And uh, this is a big old hemlock in Robert H. Treeman State Park. And looking up there, you can see that the canopy is not full of dark needles, but is actually thinning out. So this is a severely infested tree. This was taken a few years ago. So uh, we're going to um, take a look at a video with... Um, a scientist named Mark Whitmore from the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell. He's a forest entomologist, and uh, I have consolidated a number of clips that I had in that previous show into a, um, uh, a piece for this show. And uh, you'll see that these insects are, uh, this is actually a good time of year to go look for them. They are on twigs. Take a look at this twig right here. You can see little white woolly blobs. Well, those are the hemlock woolly adelgid. So we'll get right into it here. I'm going to uh, bring up this video um, just a moment. And, um, you know, it's just to give you a little perspective, it's sort of, it's been a bucolic profession actually, you know, we go out there, we look at bugs crawling around on trees and trying to figure out the best way to minimize their impact. Uh, and, you know, in the good old days, that was basically to keep them from going outbreak, to keep trees alive, and, you know, it's like it was pretty, wasn't that difficult. Now we're faced with uh, a very different um, set of rules with these invasive species that have come in recently. Uh, primarily the emerald ash borer and the hemlock woolly adelgid, they're game changers. Uh, it's, they kill trees, they kill them rather rapidly, and we don't really have uh, very many tools to work with because they're so aggressive. Uh, you, you from um, Michigan are very well aware of what's happened, basically. Um, the emerald ash, it's like, and, and please, I, I prefer when you use, when you talk about these things, don't say if. Mm -hmm. It's when it'll get here. There's just no question about it. Both bugs, they will be here. So don't don't even kid yourself about you know not thinking about it until it arrives. Because mm -hmm. actually, the best thing we can do is start planning well before it does get here, so we can help mitigate the impacts the impacts that you outlined. Um, in the watershed, you know, I think that they're they can be very dramatic. In this area, the hemlocks occupy a very important ecological role. Uh, in regards to water quality and maintaining the stability of slopes, perhaps. Um, and think about it. What will come in behind it? What else do we have uh, that, that operates that way? It's like it's very valuable for wildlife in the wintertime. Uh, and we work with very basic soils around here. So 
I'm not a soil chemist, but I'm a biologist, and I, you know, I can't help but think that the acidity that the hemlocks bring to the soil uh, uh, increases the diversity of the soil microorganisms. And the operational word with biology, in order to have a resilient uh, ecosystem, diversity is one of the major components of that. And diversity in the, in the soil microbes, I think, is important. So you know, not only the fact that it offers habitat, winter habitat, to many uh, animal and bird species. So hemlock is, is what we refer to as a keystone species uh, in the ecosystem up here. And if you really want to get scared, go down uh, to the Appalachian Mountains and see what's happened to their hemlocks down there. It's, it's really dramatic to see uh, huge, I mean, huge dead trees uh, over the landscape. Um, and they're working draft very quickly right now to try and save like 1%, 2%. So, you know, it's like um, they got started late and we're sort of lucky on, on both with both bugs because we're the beneficiary of others' uh, uh, experience. Hemlock is a different story. Hemlock, it's been a, a wild, uh, how would you say, a wild ride with the hemlock woolly adelgid. <laughs> Hemlock woolly adelgid is a little tiny sap sucking uh, bag of protoplasm. <laughs> That's the best I can say it. It's an aphid like thing. It has mouth parts that go into the tree. It injects a hormone into the bark, into the uh, uh, actually the, the uh, ray, xylem ray parenchyma cells and makes them fat, but that at the same time, and then they eat on that, but at that at the same time, in the twig, the tree has its own defenses, and it's their generic defenses against invasion. You know, you harm a tree with a hatchet or something, it actually walls off that wound. You, you get, uh, uh, you know, a pathogen coming in. The tree has a generic walling off thing. So if you have a million of these little aphids putting their mouth parts into your twigs, you're going to try and wall them off. But at the same time, what you're doing is you're disrupting your capacity to transport nutrients along the twigs and so the needles die and you get bud die back and gradually the tree dies. Um, depends on how rapidly the bugs grow. You get warmer climates like in the southern Appalachians, trees die in four years. It's been up here in the Finger Lakes area for about six years, seven years now, and we're just seeing die back right now. So it takes a little bit longer up here, but not that long. Uh, we're actually very similar when you think about the hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, it grows in the winter time. And so when you think about the effect of climate on the hemlock woolly adelgid, you don't think about summertime growing temperatures, you think about wintertime temperatures. And if you look at the wintertime temperatures, we're very similar to the Delaware Water Gap down there in northern New Jersey. Uh, we have the influence of the Ontario Plain. So it's actually in between here and, and the Delaware Water Gap, there's, it's colder. But, you know, it's actually it's his, this Delaware water gap is experiencing extreme mortality right now. Uh, six years, trees are dying, and, and actually the manager there um, is sorry that he didn't do more to treat the hemlock trees uh, when he, uh, at, the, at the time. So we have the benefit of his experience, and let's see, where was I? Hemlock will be delicate. Okay, let me rewind. I've sort of painted the picture of, of that. Let me look at some of the strategies. Hemlock woolly adelgid is native to three areas. There are three distinct biotypes. You've got China, <laughs> Japan, and the Pacific Northwest of North America. Okay, three different biotypes. In all those locations, the trees have <laughs> resistance and there's natural enemies. Here in Eastern North America, we have the Japanese biotype that became established in the 50s around Richmond, Virginia, and has spread throughout the Eastern seaboard since then. Okay, it got into the Appalachians and it's just wreaked havoc. Uh, killing all sorts of trees. So we got it in here in the Finger Lakes just recently, about six or seven years ago, and um, the evolution of the control for this has been, you know, it's, it's always a learning curve. You get it and you think, oh man, what is this? It takes a couple of years to figure out what it is, how it operates, you know, exactly what's going on biologically, and then you're thinking, okay, how do we control it? What do we do? Uh, what is our management strategy? And that takes a couple of years to develop. So, you know, basically we didn't realize it was a problem until it got out of Richmond, the Richmond area and got into the mountains and started really going crazy. So we've really been working on it for maybe the past 15, 20 years. Um, and we've come up with two tactics, I think, that uh, work right now. Um, number one, 
uh, are uh, systemic insecticides. Um, uh, the neonicotinoids, you know, the well-reviled class of chemicals, uh, uh, I think is actually an incredibly useful uh, aspect uh, for preserving hemlock, okay? <coughs> it's a systemic, it gets into the tree, and it protects the tree for up to seven years with one application, which is an amazing tool. There's really very few times you find something as effective as that. And if you're thinking about honeybees, you needn't. There are no nectaries on, on hemlock trees. They're all wind pollinated. There's no reason a honeybee would be found anywhere near the hemlock tree. Okay? So, there you go. Uh, the, um, so, that, that is one of the strategies, but that's only a short term strategy. Okay? That keeps basically the big trees alive. And that's what we need. We need to buy time because we need to establish biological controls. And we've been working on biological controls, and we have, I think, uh, one, we need, it's actually, we need a suite of biological controls, but we have one in particular right now that's been very effective. It's from the Pacific Northwest. It's the most common uh, predator in the Pacific Northwest. It's a little tiny beetle called Laracobius nigrinus, and I released about 2,500 of them in the last two days up here. I collected them down in North Carolina. They were introduced into North Carolina about 10 years ago, and they've spread from the initial introduction point about 20 miles away. And this fall, not only myself but others have collected over 11,000 uh, down there. And so they're reproducing very well uh, and they are affecting control. So there's hope. But what we need to do is we need to buy time for the biological controls to become established. And that's why we have to go out there on the landscape and actually choose our priorities. Where do we put our energy? I think a watershed is a pretty good priority uh, to maintain the integrity of the watershed. State parks, Treeman Park, Teganic Park, they have infestations. Treeman has the most, the longest, uh, uh, longest, the, the oldest infestation around, um, and it just got into Letchworth Park. But then we also have, you know, beautiful state forests around here, like Michigan Hollow. Uh, I actually just, just uh, Thursday found it in Texas Hollow. And that's a very, very high priority for me because it has an acidic bog in it, uh, the only acidic bog within miles and miles. And so I actually, I released right there. There were just a couple of trees and hopefully those predators will keep down the population. Um, so treatment in Texas Hollow I think is really difficult, but get, them, get the bugs in there, get the predators in there really early and it might be a viable thing. So there's there's things to think about. We have tools now, finally, thanks to the work uh, of others in other areas. And um, now we just need to help, I think, be aware of them and to look at what we have in place and decide what to do. So, yeah, you can see them all over. And it has sort of a lacy appearance to it. Um, you look across the way there, and most of those trees don't pay no attention to the big pines. But the, low, the smaller trees are the hemlocks. On the other side of the stream there, you see how they're sort of leaning over the stream? And you can imagine in the hot part of the day when the sun is, is going over to the west, that actually they provide a heck of a lot of shade on that stream. And they're gonna, that's why people come here to cool off in the summertime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I know, I've been thrown out by the police up here. Uh, <laughs> but, the, you know, it's like that's, that's part of the ecosystem service they provide. They cool the temperatures, and without that cool stream temperatures, we wouldn't have uh, the native brook trout. The native brook trout need to have cool streams for their, to reproduce in. But I'd also like to mention that the way the hemlock woolly adelgid gets around, okay, right now, if you wanted to try and start an infestation by grabbing onto a branch with hemlock woolly adelgids on it, it wouldn't work. Not at all. So most of the time, most of the year, you can go around and, you know, get full of hemlock woolly adelgid dust and, and you wouldn't be able to infect any other stands, or infest any other stands. Only when the eggs hatch around the end of March or the beginning of April, when the eggs hatch, the first instar that comes out is what we call a crawler. It's got some, it's actually, you know, it's like, okay, the adult's a millimeter in size. So this is about less than a quarter of a millimeter in size. Teeny tiny little thing. 
This legs are actually really operational. It moves really quickly. And if you look at it under a dissecting scope, it seems like it's on a race course. It's amazing. But those, you know, they can get blown around by wind, but what are the chances of them getting transported in the wind a long distance? Not, not very good, right? The most, the most important long distance transporter we feel are birds. What they'll do is they'll come in the winter time, around that time of year, they'll come to land on the twig, the crawler is fast, it'll get on their feet, the bird will take off, where will it go? Well, it'll probably take a drink of water, and then it'll go find another hemlock maybe, and perch on that, then it'll come off, and boom, there you go. I have what I call the skipping stone theory of population expansion, where it's sort of like I find in areas, just there'll be a population, and then there won't be any around it, and then you'll find another population nearby. Mm -hmm. sort of like, and that's why I think the birds are so important. But within a spot, the wind just dropping down and infiltrating down, that's how they spread throughout the trees. Um, but here you go. It's like here you have branches right next to a stream. If I was an adventurous, I'd walk over there right now and look at those branches because that's where we find infestations starting. Lower down. Mm -hmm. Right next to streams, yeah. right, where the birds come, they the get birds. a drink of water, and they go up. So when you're doing a survey, you don't go into the deep part of the woods. You want to stay to the edges where birds might be using the branches. So we have, uh, when, you, when you go out into the woods, is you see different age groups of, of trees. And um, I always have a special thing in my heart for, for large trees, and it's not just because they're big and magnificent. No, I'm too much of a biologist, although I grew up in the West Coast with huge trees. But I finally found the argument that makes sense for me, and that's that big trees, what do they represent? They represent an individual that's stayed and managed to persevere in one place. Trees don't move that much, even though one of my friends likes to refer to them as herds. Uh, but they stay in place and they've survived for years and years and years. There's very valuable genes in that because there's been all sorts of things that have hit that tree over time, but they've survived. You get a young tree, they're untried. And so when you're thinking about reestablishing a forest over a landscape, you want to use the genes that have survived, that are valuable in that place over time, not the little ones. You don't want to go to Kmart and buy a little tree, you know, that came from somewhere else. You want to get the local genotype that's withstood the pressures of time in place. So, when it comes to hemlock woolly adulthood, when I approach a stand, I look to the big trees as the future of the stand. And the problem with the hemlock woolly adulthood is it's like they'll infest all the trees, but the large trees, they oftentimes, they can't sustain an infestation as long as young trees do, because they have a more fragile uh, 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 a vascular system, uh, and so it can be, can be compromised. And so adelgids, when they first move into a stand, they'll take out the oldest trees first. Aww. And so that's why I think it's it, really important when you're approaching, it's like now, now something. you have time to plan in the stand. You know you have the adelgid. It's like you got to think about, okay, what are we going to do? Well, well, here, there's a big dead hemlock there. You want to look at the big ones, try and preserve those first and then go to the young ones, introduce biocontrol, so actually the biocontrol agents, the beetles, have food to eat on the young trees. And then maybe, you know, then monitor and keep introducing insects, keep introducing predators. And so over time, you'll have the populations of the predators built up to the point that you're gonna be able to impact the population and return health to the trees. Okay, so uh, a lot of information there, and uh, as you probably noted, this is the time of year when those crawlers are coming out, they're hatching out, and will start spreading, and of course, we have a lot of uh, birds moving in, so they may uh, help spread the bird, spread the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, the Cornell plantations, the state parks, and the city of Ithaca and the Six Mile Creek uh, um, Preserve and Watershed, and other entities, uh, Finger Lakes Land Trust, have all been working on uh, surveys, uh, being research sites, and also release sites for these insect uh, predators that are being tried out, and also identifying trees that are particularly important to be protected. 
So a uh, lot's going on. They've used a lot of volunteers. I haven't seen anything about volunteers being recruited this year, but I know Cornell Plantations has done a lot of that. So um, no, we've had a pretty cold winter. Maybe that'll help out with the uh, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid and Emerald Ash Borer, which is approaching this way. But uh, uh, maybe, maybe not. It might give us a little bit of time. This is a uh, upper uh, Treeman, Lucifer Falls, Enfield Gorge. There you can see the hemlocks in there. This is also in that area, all covered with hemlocks. Um, so you think, well, does this kill off the um, the hemlock woolly, woolly adelgid? Well, uh, it may, but it also may select for the cold uh, tolerant, more cold tolerant. Uh, individuals that will reproduce. I'm going to read some more uh, from research that Mark has done. There are two things going on here. Hemlock woolly adelgid reproduce asexually and have a very high reproductive rate, so all you need is a few to survive the cold and the population is often growing. So even though you might get the population knocked back, um, there will be a few to survive and they can come back quickly. Perhaps more troubling is that research indicates cold tolerance is a genetically linked trait so progeny of the survivors will also be cold tolerant. However, getting a high percentage of kill will knock back the hemlock woolly adelgid population area for a couple of years, but they will rebound rapidly. Reduced density of hemlock woolly adelgid means there is less competition and the food quality of hemlock twigs will be degraded more slowly, basically giving the surviving hemlock woolly adelgid a fertile field for reproduction and they can do that rapidly. Okay, so... Um, well, we're going to move on to another topic now having to do with our winter. I've got a couple of uh, really uh, nice videos I think you like. The first one was done uh, last year, just through uh, the end of December at Teganic Falls, and it's called First Snow. So let's take a look at that.
Okay. So um, that was uh, obviously the beginning of winter, so there was not a big ice buildup at the uh, falls. Um, I actually finished another video this morning that uh, is part of my Park Minute series, and I should be released in my Park Minute series by the weekend. And uh, let's take a look at that. Uh, that's just a couple of minutes. So we'll go to Frozen Teganic Falls. From January to March, the appearance of Teganic Falls changes with the alternation of bitter cold spells and occasional thaws. Well, enjoy it while we can. We'll have a little bit more of this kind of uh, effect. Thaw and freeze, thaw and freeze. So uh, go take a look at the falls, and eventually maybe we'll get some gushing that will happen. It'll make some more uh, amazing uh, spectacle and photography and what have you. So um, uh, yeah, we're, now we once the, uh, the land clears off of the snow, you might go around looking for something like this. This is a... Uh, Hepatica, it's called. It's a wildflower, one of the earliest wildflowers to poke up out of the leaves. And uh, it's been waiting all winter. In fact, it has some uh, leaves there, uh, just under the leaves, that are um, uh, waiting to uh, actually sprout new leaves for this season, but they've been there all winter. And then uh, early May, maybe we'll get some Dutchman's britches. And uh, then finally, some of the trees like redbud will come out. Well, that's all we have time for today. Our show is, uh, again, episode 70. Uh, look it up in walkinpark.com and all my other shows are on there as well. So thanks for joining me, and we'll see you again soon.